Hello and welcome, Folge. Good evening, Tranonoa. Gach dinagalair, mocharji galair, or fodon dawan. Good evening and welcome to Live Irish Myths. This is episode 97. I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. Today, we are returning to the subject of the annals for a more in depth look at the annals of the Kingdom of Ireland, more commonly known as the Annals of the Four Masters. A very good evening to everybody. On YouTube, Daisy Peters, our, one of our regular regulars, says, My dearest two of the Netflix. Hi, Anthony and everyone. I'm glad to be here. Like always, I'm looking forward to one more exciting episode. And like likewise, we're excited to have you here, Daisy. Thank you. I apologize. <laughs> Travels with Jason, who is just Jason from Facebook, is watching tonight on YouTube instead. Reading Shumas McManus's story of the Irish race while waiting on Netflix. Geoglitch Falcha. Jason, you're welcome along. Erica Bow says to Nona Watt to all Falcha Erica. Sirsha Nikyandal says Anthony August Natua Gomani Gia August Bandia August Nadina Shi on Shachach. Eg Tuson Lauer Arfad Anala Rilgachta Eren. And uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, that means Hi Anthony and Tribe. Uh, blessings of God and female God and the people of the she uh, uh, here uh, in the house uh, at the top or the beginning of the book uh, now and uh, um, the annals of Ireland. Brilliant stuff. Austin Davies says hi all. Gia, Gia Glitch, Austin. Mandy McCurl says hello everyone from what has been a misty day on the Isle of Mull. I'm watching the tide going out as the wind freshens and the sun is trying to come through. We heard our first thunder today in a long time but it it didn't rain in Drogheda. It was raining a few miles north of us here, uh, so we managed to escape it. Uh, on and off, sunny and sort of overcast, but a very muggy day, very warm and very muggy. Erica Rivertree says, Banachty o Louisville, Kentucky. Happy Bloomsday, and indeed, many happy returns. Happy Bloomsday to all of the uh, James Joyce fans out there. Jackie Stevenson says, hello, Anthony, and the wonderful to a fall to Jackie. You're welcome along. Sandrine Brady says, bonsoir, let le Bonsoir les amis, les, les amis. <laughs> my French is poor. It's only just a little bit worse than my Irish. I woke up at 5 a.m. with Rath Crohan on my mind and the idea that I had to go there and look for the magnetic north with my compass. I'm getting nuts. No, you'll find if you're dreaming about things, uh, well, if you were awaking from a dream and that's what you're being led towards, you should follow it. Office Care 36, uh, who is the woodsies in Monaster Boy, says it was raining on me. Yes, I have a friend who lives up on the Hill of Wrath who was saying uh, it was thundery and very heavy rain at the time. We escaped it. And on Facebook, Floyd Stevens is, sorry, Floyd St Stevers, Stevers, Floyd is the first of the commenters tonight. Fulgis, Fulgis, Floyd, you're welcome. Paula Snow Queen says hello, Gia Gwitch. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter says, okay, the bad penny from Whitney, Texas has turned back up. <laughs> oh, there's nothing bad about it. Elaine, a penny is a penny. You know, it still has value. Don't forget that. And Sirsha Nichandel has exactly the same comment here on Facebook. Talk about enthusiasm. Sirsha, it's great to see you. Rowan Grove says, hello from hot Colorado. Looking forward to the episode. Good evening, Rowan. Vicky Rourke says, Ron Hicks and I say hello. Brilliant. Is Ron Hicks with you uh, right now? Uh, if he is, please pass on my very best regards. Ron has been given, I don't know if anybody's been counting, Ron has been given at least a dozen mentions during the various episodes of Live Irish Mits. And I hope that uh, he is uh, doing well at this time. I know he's he's got a few problems on his ha hands, but we're wishing him all the best. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, actually, I must reach out to him. That's what I should do. Send on my personal best regards. Julianne Osborne is watching. Hello, Julianne. Katrina Matthews Channing says, good evening, everyone. Falsha Katrina. Barbara Barney says, hi, Anthony G. Gwitch. Don Hilton says, good evening, Anthony and everyone. Love from Lancashire. Bra, more, or Don. Mike and Jeanette are, say, it's a beautiful day in Princeton in New Jersey. Good afternoon, Anthony and all. Falcha, Michael. Brilliant to have you two along. And, of course, Jeanette. Marlon O'Hirmac says, hello, Anthony. Good evening. And a good evening to yourself, Marlon. Nice to see you. Nancy Elliott says, hello, Gia Gwich. Teresa McGuinness says, hello, all. Gia Gwich. Ralph Waldron says, Ternonawa, don toa galair as atlig. Falcha, Ralph, hope you're keeping well. Helen Langley says, hi, Anthony Falcha. Helen, Margaret Ring and Tom King are in the house. Ring and King. <laughs> and, yes, they were together at the Forge the other day. 
the ring and the king, the king, the king ringmaker. Mm, there you go. Jan Callahan says, good evening, Anthony and all. Perfect timing for once. Falsha Jan. Hope life is good in London. Stephen Greer says, hello from Little Rock, Arkansas. Slaunch it. Yes, indeed, Stephen. Slaunch it. Tussa fame. Banachti. Good evening, Anthony and all. The lovely Tua says, Margaret Ring. Thank you, Margaret. Jennifer Foley says, hello, everyone. I missed a few days. Glad to be back. We're glad to have you back. Pamela Walter says, Banachti from the Netherlands. We haven't seen you in a few, Pamela. Hope you're keeping safe and well. Lloyd Stillwell says, hello again. I'm on time. Good stuff. And McCallum says, Slauncha and happy Blooms Day to one and all from warm, sunny Ontario. My response to Coda's request to co-host Irish Myths. And there's nothing else. And perhaps uh, there's a follow-up post uh, or comment. Patricia McAteer is watching. Hello, Patricia. Kevin Tracy says, hi from Ottawa in Canada. Falja, Kevin. Veronica Casey says, hey, Anthony and all. I had to reread the title. Need my eyesight checked, I think. It gets to that stage, Veronica. I mean, I don't know. You know, hence the spectacles. Uh, Joy Buckner Winkle says hello to everyone from Minnesota. Falja, Joy, welcome back. Jan Callahan says, got some lovely rainbows in London. Brilliant. That's what that's what the advantage of showers and sunshine is. Hail Anthony on the tour from the beach where Caesar landed, says Longty Menosi. Falja Longty. Neil Hughes says to Nono off from Coatbridge, Scotland. From Neil and Mary, not forgetting Mary. Good evening to both of you. Welcome along. Maria Rodriguez Doyle says hello again. Love from Spain. Brilliant. Floyd Stevers, where in Ireland are you located? I'm in Drogheda, which uh, is very close to the great monuments of a Bruno Bonia. Uh, I'm, I'm about four miles as the crow flies from Newgrange. Oh, oh yes. Uh, it's... Sorry, I'm just taking a note. That's something I need to say later on. Uh... Mariana Dunn says, good day, dear Tua and Anthony from Virginia. Read about the history of Bloomsday early today. Brilliant stuff, Mariana. I think it wasn't Ulysses published in 1904? Or was it that the, the, the setting was June 16th, 1904? Oh, yeah, no, it was published later than that, wasn't it? Yes, don't mind me. Steve Martinson says, hello, Anthony and the Midflix clan. Be safe and be well, everyone. And exactly the same right back at you, Steve. Stay well. Good evening, Anthony, and all the friendly too. I hope all in good fettle. It's now story time, says Tom King. Tom is our uh, govon or govon or govnew. Hello, Tom. Cheryl Ann McFetridge says, Good evening and cheers to Anthony and the two from Boston. Falcher, Cheryl Ann, nice to see you. Anne McCallum says, There once was a dog named Coda who begged for a whiskey and soda, but his master opined. He'd be outrageously fined. So they settled for a Bruno Bonia. I <laughs> uh, love it. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. How do I... Uh... Oh, I can't like it at the moment. I'll like it later on. Rebecca Byrne is watching. Hello, Rebecca. Fault you. Joy Buckner Winkle says, Hello to everyone. I'm from Minnesota. Hi, Joy. Kerry O'Rear says, Hello from the FB side from myself and Finnegan the cat. Fault you. Finnegan. Finnegan, is that Finnegan, as in Finnegan's Wake? Is that a, a, a hat tip to uh, uh, Joyce, I wonder? Colin Beresford O'Connor Udell says, Hello from Connecticut, USA. My O'Connor family hails from Killarney in County Kerry, a beautiful part of the world. Welcome, Colin. Martin Doheny says, Hello, Anthony and all the two from a thundery looking southern Kilkenny skies. Thund as long as it's only thundery looking and not thundery sounding, I think we'll be all right, Martin. Good luck to you. So, I mean, good evening to you. Christina Zaba says, hi, Anthony, and everyone falls you. Aaron Durrett is watching. Hello, Aaron. Kimberly Halligan says, hi, Anthony, and Tua. A beautiful sunny day in New York. Brilliant stuff. Brenda Cassidy says, hi, from Donegal. Falls you, Brenda. Vicky wallace Suttle says, hello, my lovely friends. Hello, Vicky. And if Evan is there with you, hello, Evan. Julie Ramsey says, hello, from Washington State. The West Coasters are in the house, folks. Welcome along, Julie. Donna Jean Porter says, hello, Gia Gwich. Jason Lane Wooten says, much love from Colorado. Thank you, Jason. You're very, very welcome along. Yvette Tillema says, hi, all. Hi, Anthony. Falcha, Yvette. Megan Walter says, hi, Anthony. And to us, launch you, Megan. Uh, uh, was it yourself, Megan, that had posted the uh, video, uh, John Koch, uh, and I reposted it. I apologize. I didn't realize you had posted it already. Aaron Durrett, I wasn't trying to steal your thunder. Aaron Durrett says, greetings, dear Tua and Anthony. Looking forward to this good stuff. Doris O'Hara says, hello, Anthony and everyone. Falcha. Patricia Patsy O'Malley Boyd says, hi, everyone. Gia Gwich. 
Patricia, Gillian Gogarty is watching. Hello, Gillian. Good evening to you. And Gerrity Smith says good evening to all. Tranonawa. Bernie Courtney, good evening. Hope I can stay for longer than the last two evenings. I have still to catch up. Well, look, you have something to look forward to. <laughs> Welcome, Bernie. Wendy Holmes says hello, Anthony Giagic. Uh, Reggie Quimener, I don't know how to pronounce that, says bonjour de Bretagne in France. Bonsoir, mon ami. Make yourself very comfortable and welcome. Kirsten Salisbury says, hi all. Hi, Kirsten. I see you've been watching a few of the uh, the older Mythical Ireland videos and been enjoying them. Great stuff. Pat Rowan is watching. Hello, Pat. Connors a to Mokharja. Hope you're keeping her between the ditches. Tom King says, top of the evening to you, Anthony. Yes, indeed, Tom. <laughs> Movanway says... Evening, Anthony, and the lovely two. Looking forward to hearing more about the annals. Watched yesterday's intro. Need to catch up on the rest. All very interesting, as always. I think the annals are absolutely fantastic. They're very interesting. Cars Peel says hello from Oregon. Fulcher Cars. Alwyn Roy Badziak says, We had a thunderstorm, but it's all calm again. And hello, everyone. Fulcher. Serena Swift says hello, all. Gia Gutsch, Serena. Jim Conway says, Jim Conway tuning in. Anthony Murphy says, Anthony Murphy's glad to have you along, Jim. Fault you. Nora Gaffney O'Connor says, Hi, Anthony. And to a heavy rain and thunder here. Sea was freezing today. That's a real contrast because it's very muggy out, isn't it? You know. Uh, Maria Rodriguez Doyle says, I am in New Ross in County Wexford, a lovely part of the world, Maria. I, I, I know in particular Duncanon uh, very well. Oh, uh, beautiful here evening in West Cork, says Marie Cronin. Fault you, Marie. Glad to hear it. Jason, just Jason says, watching on Facebook as well. It just seems to be a thing, people watching on two screens. What's that like? <laughs> Philomena Breen says, Fault you from beautiful rain and whirl weather. Love your stories. Thank you, Philomena. You're very well welcome along. Okay, anyone else? Gillian Smith is here. Hello, Gillian. Fault you. Rebecca Byrne says, hey. Rebecca Byrne is my niece. There you go. Hello, niece. How's life with you? I hope you're keeping well. I, I think you're back to work after the recent uh, lockdown. I hope that's going well. Uh, Peter Kieran's is watching. Hello, Peter. Slaunche. Alan Mulligan says, hi from Belfast. Alan, you're very welcome along. I hope Belfast is being spared the thunderstorms right now. Uh, Regina Riley says hello all Gia Gutsch, Regina Jerry Andrade says hello Anthony and Tua from a dark, thundery and damp Merseyside. <laughs> Ooh, come here, listen, don't be sending that over this way because they're coming over the Irish Sea, you know. Now you just make sure you keep it over there, right? <laughs> Alan, Alan Hoskins says hi from Ballina Killaloo. Yes, how's Bale Baru these days, Alan? Yeah, and uh, you're not too far from Tultinja, very important place. A place I've never been, but a place that's calling me in my heart. It's a place that I have to go to soon. So just Jason, just Jason says, do you have any signed copies of your New Grange book available? I don't. They're all sold out. Uh, my copies are. But I will endeavor to get more copies from the warehouse uh, in the next week or two, because there are back orders uh, also for Mythical Ireland, which I'm out of, apart from my own personal copies. So I'll let you all know as soon as I have them. Megan says, it's okay. Lol, just made me feel justified that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Did you see all the comments underneath the video? People were giving out about all the oohs and ahs and the way he kept pausing. I, that didn't bother me at all. He was tremendously interesting to listen to. And actually, if you listen to that video, uh, if you watch that video, he covers a lot of the topics that we've been discussing on and off uh, during Live Irish Myths. And I was fascinated. I thought he was really good, actually. He was very enjoyable. Maeve Fina Callahan says, Greetings, Anthony and Tua, Falcha. Laura O'Domatroy says, After doing yoga by the lake in the rain, a story will be more than welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Laura. That sounds really nice. Hope you enjoyed the lake and the rain. Bethany Cutler. Tommy Tullichta Anish. Hello, Tua. I'm not sure what that Tullichta means. It may be a misspelling, but it's it's be, not beyond the round of possibility that my Irish is so poor. Pardon me while I just look it up, will you? Apparently, it's another word for happy. Ta ahas more art, Bethany. 
you're you're very welcome along. Paula Snow Queen says, "Oh, he's talking. You're talking to someone else." Rebecca Bourne says, "Hello, Uncle. Going very well. Well, I'm glad to hear it." Megan says, "Hi, Anthony's niece." <laughs> Mello Nello, whose name is Neil, says, Hi there, Anthony and Tua. Glad to see you all this evening. We really enjoyed your video. The fireflies, Neil. That was fantastic. I've never seen fireflies in real life. We'll have a pint, says Jason. Someday we'll all get together for a drink around the fire. Barbara Kling says, Hello, Anthony and Tua from a sunny and hot northern Vermont. Falcha, Barbara. Uh, Donna Firer says, Tuning in from Maryland. Hello, everyone. Gia Gwich, Donna. Alan Hoskins says, Bale Baru is looking well. I shall have to visit when I'm allowed. Aaron says, any cousin of Anthony's is a cousin of ours. Rebecca getting a nice, great welcome there. Ah, Scottish, Bethany, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. That makes sense. I apologize. Yes. You see, just I'm every day is a learning experience. No matter how much you think you know, and I don't think I know all that much. Every day you're learning something new. Keith O'Neill, is it O'Neill? How do you pronounce that O? I know uh, UI father is a, a, apparently a, a, <laughs> a, a nail, isn't it? Uh, O'Neill, I'm just saying Keith O'Neill, uh, you are descended from a very distinct. Uh, very distinguished royal line, uh, Keith, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, going back all the way to uh, Niall uh, Nig Yolak, Niall of the Nine Hostages. What was the movie Anthony was referencing? Documentary that we have touch base on, uh, says Yvette. It is uh, John T. Koch, Koch, C O C C O K O C H. It's on the Mythical Ireland community page. Um, Megan posted it, and I also posted it uh, a couple of days ago. You might have to scroll down the list a bit, uh, but it was fascinating. Uh, talking about movements of people and DNA and mythology and Newgrange, etc. It was brilliant. It was really entertaining. Mm -hmm. What is the lookup? My, my mum is a Fáinne holder, Fáinne ring. What is the lookup? Um, Keith, I'm not sure. Ring, yes, indeed, a fauna, yes, of course. Michael Kenny, ta fauna, Aaron Gallachanucht. There is a halo around the moon tonight. Michael Kenny is watching Folge. Michael Alan Mulligan says, Have you been up to Owen Maka, Anthony? Such an atmosphere. Haven't been up in a long, long time. And I'm yearning to go to all these places now, of course. Keith says, Just oh, I apologize. Yes, I'm, I, I, uh, I just wasn't sure. That's all. Uh, uh Keith O'Neill. But a, a very distinguished name, of course. Uh, Adina Spark says, just coming in. Afternoon all. That's fine. We haven't started. Keith says, it's the Southern O'Neill. We have to get that right. <laughs> no problem. Um, and the Barry Cunliffe lecture, I haven't watched uh, Yvette, uh, but uh, Barry Cunliffe is always interesting. Okay, Megan has posted the link there again for anyone that wants to watch it later. That's great. Sandra Peterson says, Hi, Tua from Scotland. What are we all doing for Solstice? Um, I'm going to do a special uh, summer solstice related theme for the solstice, but I don't know uh, if people have other plans for what they're actually doing that day. Rex Fortenbury says, Banachty from Baton Rouge. Falcha, Rex, good evening to you. And back to YouTube. Oh, my God. Just when you think you've caught up. Michael Patrick Donnelly says, Hi from West Sussex. Falcha, Michael. Uh, Irish Technical Thinker says, Jigrich os bail ferishta ta'an amshar gudona agus ta'sha e korbashti. So it's dark and raining. Ta'amij e genev kuma agus gramor. Good stuff. And I presume Marcus Rachel is with you. Uh, Falcha to both of you. Good evening. Uh, Mez Marion says, hi all from Marion on sunny and lovely Alameda, California. Good stuff, Marion. Hope it's nice over there today. Learn to ride video, says Anthony. You need to slow down on the videos. There's only 24 hours in a day and I can't keep up. <laughs> That's the problem with coming in, you know, uh, now is that you have so much to catch up on. But don't worry. I mean, it's all good. Plenty to keep you occupied. Flower Child says, Falcher from Las Vegas. Banachty, Flower Child. Good evening to you. I think we're all up to date. Jason Lane Wooten. Solstice is going to be amazing this year. 
Pat Rowan says, hope everyone is well. There's going to be a, a an annular solar eclipse where the moon isn't big enough to cover the whole sun, but it'll only be visible, I think it's mostly in Africa, uh, on the day of summer solstice. <laughs> Tana Fire says, guess we will be here for solstice. Oh, I apologize. Didn't mean to do that. Okay, so what's that? Oh, let's call that. Let's call that uh, 2030, shall we? By the time I get it noted in the book. And before we proceed. Oh, that's a long time for introductions, isn't it? Uh, I wanted to say congratulations to Margaret Kiernan on having two poems included in the UCD Library's Pandemic Poetry Archive. Uh, so well done to Margaret. Margaret is one of the, uh, she's on the Mythical Ireland community page. And uh, brilliant stuff and well done from all of us to you. And just to mention, as always, thank you very much to the Mythical Ireland patrons at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland who help to make it all happen. Your support is greatly appreciated. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you would take a moment to consider becoming a patron, I'll share the link and you can have a look at the rewards that you get for your patronage. Tonight, we are back on the subject of the annals. Uh, the intention yesterday was to introduce the annals and to get stuck into the annals of the Four Masters. As it turns out, there was so much material just to introduce the annals uh, that uh, we, uh, um, we needed to do at least one more episode. But of course, there'll be a further episode at least uh, because we have to do the annals of Ulster as well, which are uh, not quite as comprehensive perhaps uh, but equally enthralling and intriguing and fascinating. I'm going to read some of the introductory remarks from John O'Donovan's wonderful translation and editing uh, and uh, his, uh, what you would call his enormous work. Um, because uh, we were saying, weren't we, that the... Uh, the publication of the Annals by O'Donovan ran to a total of seven large volumes. It is, a, it is an extremely onerous, or it was an extremely onerous project uh, for O'Donovan to undertake. We are greatly indebted to him for doing that, but we are mostly indebted in this regard to the original scribe, well, the chief of the scribes of the Annals of the Four Masters, who was Michael O'Cleary. He was born in the late 1500s, uh, and who, along with several colleagues, compiled the annals at the monastery at uh, Donegal in the 1600s. Uh, but before that, as we heard last night, uh, he went to all of the monasteries in Ireland, uh, whatever way he could, uh, initially transferring the material that he was collecting and copying on his way to uh, Louvain, wasn't it? Uh, but later, uh, when the monk there who was looking after things passed on, uh, he had to uh, bring them all together in Donegal and devoted three and a half years to compiling the annals. The annals, um, I think we touched on this last night, but it's worth mentioning, the annals, uh, while uh, not considered a purely historic document, uh, certainly cannot be classified as uh, mythological, nor can they be classified as pseudo-historical. Certainly uh, from the time of the establishment of the early monasteries in the 6th and 7th centuries onwards. It is a remarkable record. One of the difficulties with chronicling the arrival of the various peoples uh, mentioned in Lower Gawala in pre-Christian times is, as we said last night, we've no corroboratory, uh, we've no way of corroborating what is said in the annals in that regard. We've nothing else to, uh, to compare it with no other historical records. However, that does not undermine uh, the annals in any way. And we had the erstwhile and uh, very uh, praiseworthy words of Douglas Hyde in relation to the annals last night. And Hyde, uh, where was I reading that today? Oh, or last night. Sorry, I'm getting, that's another rabbit hole. Uh, I, was, I believe I was reading a book about early Christianity in Ireland uh, and how the early Celtic Christianity kind of keeps being rejuvenated. Um, but anyway, the subject was that, you know, while A.E. 
uh, George William Russell and our friend W.B. Yeats were romantic and attached themselves to the mythology. Uh, Hyde, while he collected a lot of stories and folklore, uh, was, was uh, a little bit more of a historian, as it were. Uh, but he had great things to say about the annals. So I'm going to introduce it here, and I'm going to talk a little bit. These are from uh, O'Donovan's introductory notes. We're going to talk in particular today about uh, uh, celestial events, astronomical events, such as eclipses, the appearance of comets, etc., etc., uh, which are the method by which the accuracy and the dating of the annals can be tested even in modern times, we can work back and make the calculations and find out if uh, a particular eclipse happened at the time it was said to have happened. With respect to the chronology of these annals from AM 2242 down to the period of Kimbaith, no competent scholar can doubt that it is arbitrary and uncertain. But we are not to suppose that the four masters are altogether responsible for it. This early portion of the annals, it must be borne in mind, was compiled by them from the annals of Clonmac Noise and from different other authorities, such as the synchronisms of Flan, the poems of Maelmura on the origin of the Gael, the poems of Gila Cavan, Yoki O'Flynn, and various other sources. And as compilers, their duty was to play such accounts as were accessible of direct computation in as natural and reasonable an order as possible. Alex Casterton is in the house. Fall to Alex. Good evening to you. We're, we've only just started, so don't be worrying. Make yourself comfortable. Unfortunately, however, among all the events narrated, no eclipse of the sun or moon or appearance of a comet or any other astronomical phenomenon is recorded by which their authenticity could be tested on a certain date fixed. O'Flaherty expresses his surprise indeed at the minute chronological accuracy with which the earliest historical facts, as he considers them, are noticed by Irish historians, such as the arrival in Ireland of Kezair, the granddaughter of Noah, with a band of antediluvians. Coda is trying to have a say, is say out there. Yes, yes, yes. We feed the dog, will you? <laughs> He's saying, I thought we were co hosting. I thought you were doing dogs tonight. 40 days before the flood, on the 15th day of the moon being the Sabbath, and the landing of Partholan at Inverskania in Kerry in the month of May, the 14th day of the moon on a Wednesday. From the minuteness of these dates, the author of, Egi of, of Ogigia, instead of having his suspicions aroused, does not hesitate to conclude that the pagan Irish had, from the earliest period, a most accurate system of chronology. And I would be inclined to agree with that. Jackie McCandless says, greetings from Stroud in Gloucestershire. Fall to Jackie, you're very welcome. Um, we, we would be inclined to agree with that, wouldn't we? Because we've seen the calendrical attempts, or at least that's our interpretation of several of the curbstones at the great monuments of Brunabonia, which are Neolithic, which are more than 5,000 years old. We would say that uh, a complex calendar was in place long, long before any of this stuff happened. Esther David says, hi there from the UK. Fall to Esther, you're very welcome. But it never seems to have occurred to him to ask the simple question, how were the age of the moon and the day of the week at the landing of Kazair and Partholan handed down to the Irish writers? Seeing that, according to those writers themselves, Kazair and her followers perished in the flood and that Partholan and his colony were all carried off by the plague. And of course, we mentioned yesterday we had somebody watching from Tala in Dublin, Tala Muncher Partholan the grave mounds of the people of Partholon. Coda definitely wants to co-host tonight. Yes, he's... Uh... Ah, he's always grand. The Bardic historians reply by getting still deeper into fiction and relating that Fintan, the son of Bochra, that is Fintan Mac Bochra, 
who accompanied Kezair into Ireland after having passed through various transmigrations, at length assumed the human form in the time of St. Patrick and lived down to the time of St. Finian of my, well, it's the Irish is my, my villa, M-A-G-H-B-H-I-L-E, which means the plain of the sacred tree. I think that's anglicised into Moyville. To whom he narrated all the events that had taken place in Ireland up to that period. O'Flaherty rejects this as a clumsy fable, but finds himself constrained in order to support his chronological theory to insist that the pagan Irish had the use of letters and an accurate system of chronology from the earliest period of the colonisation of Ireland. This way of proving the authenticity of Irish chronology only damages true history. But at the same time, there is a mode of explaining the entries in question, so as to obviate the necessity of rejecting them altogether. We have only to assume that they are facts preserved by oral tradition, and that the Irish writer who first attempted to fix the age of the moon and the day of the week on which Kazair landed in Ireland, made such calculations as he was able to make, whether correct or not is of no consequence. Computing 40 days before to the usually assumed date of Noah's flood, and seeking to account for his accurate knowledge of the date, so assumed by means of a bold fiction. In this latter object, strange to say, he partially succeeded, for, silly as it may now seem to us, it is a fact that the fable connected with these dates passed currently amongst the Irish literati down to the 17th century. For though Yochi O'Flanagan of Armagh in the 11th century gave no credit to the story of Finton having survived the general deluge, his scepticism surely did not arise from its improbability, but because it involved a statement contrary to the Holy Scripture, which saith that all the world were drowned in the general flood, saving Noah and his three sons, Shem, Cham and Japheth, with their four wives, F-O-W-E-R. <laughs> it is therefore surely infinitely more probable that an early Irish chronologist made a calculation of the age of the moon and the day of the week as they would retrospectively stand 40 days before the deluge than that he found anything purporting to be a record of the date of Kezair's arrival on stone, tile or parchment. It would be easier to receive the whole story of Kezair and her followers, as well as the date for a fabrication, than to suppose that any written or inscribed record of such a fact could have existed before the use of letters or even of hieroglyphics was known to mankind. I dispute that because I think that the hieroglyphics, if that's what you want to call them, the geoglyphs, not the geoglyphs, the the uh, the petroglyphs, the megalithic art, uh, may very well have successfully encoded uh, lunar uh, patterns, lunar uh, periods uh, on the faces of some of the stones at Brunabonia. The accuracy of ancient dates being thus apocryphal, we are driven to regard the catalogue of kings given by Gila Cavan and others as a mere attempt at reducing to chronological order the accumulated traditions of the poets and Shanachies of Ireland. But that a list of Irish monarchs was attempted to be made out at a very early period is now generally admitted by the best antiquaries. Mr Pinkerton, who denies to the Irish the use of letters before their conversion to Christianity, still admits the antiquity of their list of kings. Sorry, I'm missing uh, comments. Michael Freeman is watching. Hello, Michael Falcher. Kodak means friend in the Sioux language. Foreigners, he remarks, may imagine that it is granting too much to the Irish to allow them lists of kings more ancient than those of any other country in modern Europe. But the singularly compact and remote situation of that island and its freedom from Roman conquest and from the concussions of the fall of the Roman Empire may infer this allowance not too much. But all contended for is the list of kings so easily preserved by the repetition of bards at high solemnities and some grand events of history. Uh, and that is from Pinkerton's inquiry into the history of Scotland. 
At what period regular annals first began to be compiled with regard to minute chronology, we have no means of determining. But we must safely infer from the words of Chirnock that the ancient historical documents existing in his time were all regarded by him as uncertain before the period of Kimbaith, his co the commencement of whose reign he fixes at the year before Christ 305. Uh, I should say in this matter very briefly uh, that the book that I'm reading, and I don't have it to hand, it's actually a, it's up beside the bed because I was reading it in bed last night. Very interestingly, the guy that wrote the book is, I think, an Anglican pastor, or uh, he's attached to the Church of England. Um, can't remember his name. But he said something very interesting that I think in the sixth century, there was a serious plague. Uh, and it affected not just the populace, but of course the monasteries as well. And because it took such a hefty toll of life, that I think he's he, he was sort of implying that uh, as a result of the plague, the, mo the monks in the monasteries began to realise if we don't start writing stuff down, we could all be wiped out in a plague and nobody will know anything about us. And that that is what prompted uh, the first keeping of such records. Now, I could be mistaken in that. And uh, actually, the book that I'm reading, uh, I couldn't put it down last night. That that would make an episode all on its own. Uh, an episode about the early uh, Celtic Christian church, perhaps. His significant words, Omnia monumenta scotorum usque kimbaeth incerta, or is it incerta, I-N-C-E-R-T-A, errant inspire a feeling of confidence in this compiler which commands respect for those facts which he has transmitted to us <coughs> even when they relate to the period antecedent to the Christian era. <coughs> the Annals of Ulster are also free from the objections that have been alleged against the early, early portion of the Annals of the Four Masters. The compiler beginning with the mission of Palladius to the Scoti uh, that is uh, Palladius, the precursor of Patrick uh, in the 4th century, in the 300s, and frequently citing the names of the authors or compilers whose works he had before him, the oldest of which is Machta, the patron saint of Louth, that is my own county, County Louth, St. Machta, and Kona, genitive Konach, who seems to be Kona Scri Scriba Troit, T-R-E-O-I-T, whose death is recorded under the year 739. And Dov Dalafe, who was at first lector and afterwards Archbishop of Armagh, and who died in the year 1065. The following passages extracted from the Annals of Ulster will show that they have been copied from various sources. And, and he, he gives various examples. AD 439, Chronicon Magnum Scriptum Est. Uh, it wasn't that the one we were saying, Shanachus Moore. Uh, it was compiled. Preda Seconda Saxonum de Hibernia ut Ali Dicunt in Isto Anno Deducta Est ut Moctus Dicit. D-I-C-I-T. Sick in libro, cornach in veni. And I, I'm not going to try and pronounce any more Latin. I didn't study Latin. It's probably very obvious. Jonathan Donald Voy McLean says, hello, late as usual or on time. Don't be worrying. A wizard is never late. For the baggage, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. From these notices, we have reason to believe that the ecclesiastical writers carried forward a continuous chronicle from age to age. Each succeeding analyst transmitting the records which he found existing along with his own, thus giving to the whole series the force of contemporary evidence. The precision with which the compiler of the Annals of Ulster has transmitted the account of an eclipse of the sun which took place in the year 664, wasn't that the year of the, the Synod of Whitby? I'm pretty sure it was, 664. Didn't realise there was a, a, an eclipse uh, uh, synod Yes, 664 is the, the year of the Synod of Whitby. Affords a proof that this entry was derived from... Sorry, my apologies while I turn the page. Oh, I shouldn't have put my fingers in my mouth. Don't anybody do that. That was stupid of me. Uh, that this entry was derived from a contemporaneous record. See note X under AD 664, page 277. Venerable Bede, B-E-D-E... -E, 
And that was that wasn't a Bilbo imitation. That that was a Gandalf imitation, of course. And he was talking to Frodo. A wizard is never late, Frodo Baggins. Venerable Bede, who is followed by the Four Masters, mentions this solar eclipse as having occurred on the third day of May, but the annals of Tiernock and Ulster have preserved the exact day and hour. Megan says, see, the saints and their associated stories and feats are part of why I think some mythological personages may be based on real people, the heroes, for instance. The trappings of the mystical don't mean the saints never existed and their historical figures. Yeah, and, and don't forget, in addition to that, that none of the lives of the saints were contemporary with the lives of the saints. The earliest uh, that they were committed, uh, and I'm not sure if that, I don't think that was the the uh, uh, tri uh, tripartite life of Patrick. I think it was another, was it uh, uh, Adam? Non no, I can't remember. But the earliest that a life of a saint was actually written after that saint's death was 100 years. It is easy to, you know, um, shall we say, embellish the events with fanciful details a century after. Raymond Lawson says, I missed the imitation. Okay, I'll do it again. A wizard is never late, Frodo Baggins. He arrives precisely when he means to. That's an impression of Ian McKellen's Gandalf, by the way. Ah... <sighs> Bede, having evidently calculated the time according to the Dion Dionysian cycle, the error of which was not detected in his time, and the Irish analysts having copied the passage from the record of one who had seen this eclipse and noted it at the time of observation. Anne Garrity Smith says, great stories can be added in 100 years, all right. Yes. Patricia Lochran McTague says, hello all, late but live, which is always a good thing. Fault you, Patricia. Paula says, try saying that to your boss when you're late. Yeah. <laughs> Anthony, you're late. The wizard is never late, nor is he early. Mm. <laughs> ah, yes, I apologise. The following notices of eclipse and comets, copied from various works by the compiler of the Annals of Ulster, will show that they were recorded by eyewitnesses. The reader is to bear in mind that the annals of Ulster are antedated by one year up to 1014, and that in comparing these eclipses with the catalogue of eclipses composed by modern astronomers, he should add one year to the respective dates. Uh, AD 495, which is really 496, solis defectio. <laughs> mm, so defect on the sun. AD 511 or 512, defectus solis contigit. Defecto solus imain teneb tenebrosum, that's 591, 614, stella comata, visa est hora octava d. Uh, that's a comet. 664, tenebrae in calendis mai in 2a hora, h o r a, uh, 11. Is that two? Yes, I'm, I'm getting confused here. That's Roman numerals. Is that the second hour? Don't know. Nubes tenuis et tremula ad specium celestis arcus, iv vigilia noctis vi feria ante pasca, ab oriente in occidentem, parcerenum celum apparut, luna in sanguinum versa est. <laughs> of course, as you can see, some of the annals, by the way, are in Latin and some of them are in Middle Irish. I know there's various exam examples. 878. Eight. Eclipsis lunae idibus octobris, IV lun, L U N E, IV with a dot after it. I'm not sure what that means. And for instance, AD 1018, the comet permanent this year for 14 days in harvest. AD 1023, an eclipse of the moon, the fourth ID of January being Thursday, an eclipse of the sun, the 27th of the same moon on Thursday, which is fascinating because, as you all know, uh, we had, didn't we, a penannular eclipse on, wasn't it the 5th or the 6th of, of May, or June, sorry. We're going to have a total solar eclipse on the summer solstice 
uh, which is this weekend. And then we're going to have another lunar eclipse two weeks after because eclipses happen in these sort of patterns. Because why? Because the uh, sun and the moon, uh, because the moon is um, uh, on a node uh, at the right uh, moment. Uh, if the moon's path were not inclined to the path of the sun or the ecliptic, then we would get a total eclipse of the sun and the moon every month, every lunar month. The dates assigned to these eclipses are confirmed by their accordance with the catalogue of eclipses in L'Art de Ver les Dates. Is that French? D-A-T-E-S? Dates? Les Dates? Tom E. Blah, blah, blah. That's the, that's the reference. And from this accuracy, it must be acknowledged that they have been obtained by actual observation and not from scientific calculations. For it is well known that any after calculations made before the correction of the Dionysian period would not have given such correct results. Mr. Moore has the following remarks upon the eclipse of 664. And of course, that is the year of the uh, Synod of Whitby. The precision with which the Irish analysts have recorded to the month, day and hour, an eclipse of the sun, which took place in the year 664, affords both an instance of the exceeding accuracy with which they observed and noted passing events, and also an, an undeniable proof that the annals for that year, though long since lost, must have been in the hands of those who have transmitted to us to us that remarkable record. In calculating the period of the same eclipse, the venerable Bede led astray, it is plain, by his ignorance of that yet undetected error of the Dionysian cycle, by which the equation of the motions of the sun and moon was affected, exceeded the true time of the event by several days. Whereas the Irish chronicler, wholly ignorant of the rules of astronomy and merely recording what he had seen past passing before his eyes, namely that the eclipse occurred about the 10th hour on the 3rd of May in the year 664, has transmitted a date to posterity of which succeeding astronomers have acknowledged the accuracy. And that is quoted from Moore's History of Ireland, volume 1, page 163. <sighs> Fascinating. At what period it became the practice in Ireland to record public events in the shape of annals has not yet been accurately determined. But it will not be too much to assume that the practice began with the first introduction of Christianity into the country. Now, it is highly probable that there were Christian communities in Ireland long before the final establishment of Christianity by St. Patrick in the 5th century. We learn from St. Chrysostom in his Demonstratio, Demonstratio Quod Christus Sit Deus, written in the year 387, that the British islands, situated outside the Mediterranean Sea and in the very ocean itself, had felt the power of the divine word, churches having been founded there and altars erected. But the most decided evidence that the Irish had the use of letters before St. Patrick's time is derived from the account of Celestius, an Irishman, the favourite disciple of the heresiarch Pelagius. Pelagius, I apologise. St. Jerome, alluding to a criticism of Celestius upon his commentaries of the, on the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians, thus launches out against this bold heretic. Uh, and and that, is in, uh, that is all in Latin, unfortunately. Nuper inductus calumniator erupit qui commentarios meos in epistolam pauli, Ad efficios reprehend reprehendendos putat. <laughs> I, I I'm not going to read on because it's on. I think it's uh, maybe in in his day. Uh, scholars, of course, like O'Donovan, would have been expected to be able to speak uh, and uh, read and write in Latin. Uh, in fact, uh, until I, I was going to school, uh, I avoided it kind of thankfully, but then in a way I kind of regret it. The Christian brothers in Ireland were still teaching Latin uh, as a subject. 
up until about the 1970s, certainly, maybe, maybe even the 1980s. It appears from Gennadius, who flourished AD 495, that before Celestius was imbued with the Pelagian heresy, mm -hmm. he had written from his monastery to his parents three epistles in the form of little books, containing instructions necessary for all those desirous of serving God, which, by the way, bore no trace of the heresy which he afterwards broached. Uh, and the words of Gennadius are as follows, but again, all in Latin. Celestius antiquam Pel Pelagianum dogma incor incorrerit immo ad, ho ad hoc adolescens scriptsit ad parentes de monasterio epistolas in modem li libellorum tres omnibus deum desiderantibus Necessarius. I think you could probably translate some of that. You could make a good guess at it. <laughs> this passage affords sufficient evidence to prove that the Scotica gens in the neighbourhood of Britain had the use of letters towards the close of the 4th century. And it may be added that a country that produced such able men as Celestius and Albinus could hardly have been on an utter stranger to civilization at the time they flourished. On the whole, it may be conjectured, conjectured with probability that letters were known to the Irish about the reign of Cormac, son of art. And this throws the boundary between what must have been traditional and what may have been original written records so far back as to remove all objection on that ground to the authenticity of the following annals from at least the second century of the Christian era. The reader will find these conclusions supported by the opinions of a historian of the highest character on the general authenticity and historical value of that portion of the Irish annals uh, made accessible to him by the labours of Dr. O'Connor. And here is a quote. The Chronicles of Ireland, written in the Irish language from the second century to the landing of Henry Plantagenet, have been recently published with the fullest evidence of their genuineness and exactness. The Irish nation, though they are robbed of their legends by this, this authentic publication, are yet by it enabled to boast that they possess genuine history several centuries more ancient than any other European nation possesses in its present spoken language. They have exchanged their legendary antiquity for historical fame. Indeed, no other nation possesses any monument of its literature in its present spoken language, which goes back within several centuries of these chronicles. I apologise. Now, uh, Asher, we're nearly there. Yes, and, and there follows some words of thanks uh, from the editor, John O'Donovan, to various people, including the provost and senior fellows of Trinity College Dublin, etc., 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 and here is uh, ep the epistle dedicatory from Michael O'Cleary to Fergal O'Gara, Lord, Lord of My Igara, etc. And so these are uh, Michael O'Cleary's own words, which begin the original uh, compilation of the Annals of the Four Masters or the dedication of it. I beseech God to bestow every happiness that may redound to the welfare of his body and soul upon Fergal O'Gara. Lord of Mai Gaura and Quill Ovin, one of the Knights of Parliament who were elected and sent from the county of Schligach, that's Sligo, to Arclia, that's Dublin, this year of the age of Christ, 1634. It is a thing general and plain throughout the way, so sorry, throughout the whole world, in every place where nobility or honour has prevailed in each successive period, that nothing is more glorious more respectable or more honourable for many reasons than to bring to light the knowledge of the antiquity of aforesaid matters. Sorry, sorry, I apologise, I skipped a page. Than to bring to light the knowledge of the antiquity of ancient authors and a knowledge of the chieftains and nobles that existed in preceding times in order that each successive generation might possess knowledge and information as to how their ancestors spent their time and life how long they were successive, successively in the lordship of their countries, in dignity or in honour, and what sort of death they met. I, Michael O'Cleary, a poor brother of the Order of St. Francis, 
after having been for 10 years transcribing every old material which I found concerning the saints of Ireland, observing ob obedience to each provincial that was in Ireland successively, have come before you, O noble Farrell O'Gara. I have calculated on your honour that it seemed to you a cause of pity and regret, grief and sorrow for the glory of God and the honour of Ireland, how much the race of Gael and son of Niall have gone under a cloud and darkness without a knowledge of the death or obit of saint or virgin, archbishop, bishop, abbot, or other notable dignitary of the church, or king or prince, lord or chieftain, and of the synchronism or connection of the one with the other. Of course, don't forget, in medieval Ireland, there were also uh, saint uh, uh, bishop kings. There were people who were both uh, uh, kings and uh, religious leaders. I explained to you that I thought I could get the assistance of the chroniclers, for whom I had most esteem for writing a book of annals in which the aforesaid matters might be put on record, and that, should the writing of them be neglected at present, they would not again be found to be put on record or commemorated to the end and termination of the world. The end and termination. Don't those two things mean the same thing? Hmm, interesting. There were collected by me all the best and most copious books of annals that I could find throughout all Ireland though it was difficult for me to collect them to one place. To write this book in your name and to your honour, for it was you that gave the reward of their labour to the chroniclers by whom it was written. And it was the friars of the convent of Donegal that supplied them with food and attendance in like manner. That sounds like something we kind of already covered last night, doesn't it? That's not Coda, that's a different dog. Anala Rilgachta Erin. And the very first entry. The age of the world to this year of the deluge, 2242. Forty days before the deluge, Kazair came to Ireland with 50 girls and three men, Bith, Laura and Fintan, their names. Laura died at Ard Lauren, and from him it is named. He was the first that died in Ireland. Bith died at Schlieve Baha, B-E-A-T-H-A, and was interred in the cairn of Schlievbaha, and from him the mountain is named. Kesair died at Coil Kesra in Connacht and was interred, interred in Carn Kesra. From Finton is named Fart F-E-A-R-T, Fart Finton over Loch Jarigjark, and a, a Fiart uh, is a grave or a grave mound. From, and of course, uh, uh, he didn't actually die, uh, according to our traditions. He survived by transforming into a, sw a, a salmon and swimming in the waters of the flood uh, in a cave at the top of the mountain of Tol Tinja, the hill of Tim Tol Tinja, which is in modern day County Tipperary, overlooking uh, Loch, Loch Derg and also uh, uh, the, uh, within sight of um, Balana Killaloo, mentioned earlier. I can't remember who it was that said that they were in that area. From the deluge until Partholon, Partholon took possession of Ireland 278 years and the age of the world when he arrived in it, 2520. The age of the world when Partholon came into Ireland, 2520 years. These were the chieftains who were with him, Slánia, Lailinia and Ruri, his three sons, Delignat, Nerva, Kirchva and Kervnad, their four wives. The age of the world, 2527, Fea, son of Thornton, son of Shrew, died this year at My Fay. He was interred at Dolry My Fay, so that it was from him the plain is named. Etc. etc. I'm gonna skip forward a little bit because I want to find I want to find out where was the um, yes here we go the age of the world 2820 9,000 of Partholon's people died in one week on Shanvai Alta Eder namely 5,000 men and 4,000 women whence is named Talacht 
Muncha Partalon, and, and that's where the modern name of Tala gets its name. Uh, and uh, Shanvai is the old plain Alta, E A L T A. I'm not sure. Edar is the old name of Dublin Bay, but particularly that part stretching out to Hoth, Ben Ether, the, the, the head of Hoth or the Hoth head. They had passed 300 years in Ireland. Ireland was 30 years waste until Neved's arrival. And that's pr- pr- spelt and pronounced all sorts of manners a different way. Nemed, Neved, Nevid, Nemedians. The age of the world, 2850. Nevid came to Ireland on the 12th day after the arrival of Nevid with his people. Macha, the wife of Nevid, died. These were the four chieftains who were with him. Starn, Irvanel, Ir- the prophet, Fergus Lechjarig, and Ein Einin. These were the four sons of Nevid. Meju, Macha, Iba, and Kira were, Kira were the four wives of these chieftains. In the age of the world, it's very interesting because the annals also chronicle the eruption of lakes or the, the, the sudden appearance of lakes in the landscape. The age of the world, 28, 29. In this year, Loch Darvrak, which is Loch Darvara, famous, made famous by the uh, Children of Lear story, which we read over, was it two or three episodes a while back? Uh, and of course, it is actually a swan-shaped lake. And Loch Einin in Mead sprang forth. These were the forts that were erected, the plains that were cleared, and the lakes that sprang forth in the time of Nevid. But the previous years are not found for them. Sorry, the precise years are not found for them. Rath Kinnach uh, in, in, in Ireland, Rath Kinbaith in Mag- Magneva, etc., etc., etc. Nevid afterwards died of a plague, together with 3,000 persons in the island of Ard Nevid in Creich Leahan in Munster. So there's another uh, uh, wave, uh, incursion, another uh, a band of people who arrived into Ireland who were wiped out by a plague. It's a very strange thing. Uh, and I wanted to get to the year that you're all waiting for me to get to, I'm sure. The age of the world, 3303. The 10th year of the reign of Yochi, son of Urk. And he was the last of the kings of the Furvolog. And this was the last year of his reign, for the two of the Danans came to invade Ireland against the Furvologs. And they gave battle to each other at Moichura in Conmachna Kulyatora Tulla in Connacht. And of course, that is the first battle of Moichura or Moichura Kong. Not to be confused with the second battle of Moichura, which happens uh, in County Sligo. So that the King Yochi, son of Urk, was killed by the three sons of Nevid. Son of Bauri of the two of the Danans, Kesarb, Luov, and Luokra, their names. The Fervologs were vanquished and slaughtered in this battle. Moreover, the hand of Nuadat, is, again, that's another name that's spelt various different renderings. Nu, that's Nuada or Nuadu of the silver hand. Moreover, the hand of Nuadat, son of Yochi, son of Edarlav, the king who was over the two of the Danans, was cut off in the same battle. The aforesaid Yochi was the last king of the king Furbologs, or the Furbologs. Nine of them had assumed kingship, and 37 years was the length of their sway over Ireland. 3304, the first year of the reign of Bress, son of Elathan, over Ireland, uh, for the two of the Danon gave him the sovereignty after gaining the battle of Moichura Conga, while the hand of Nuadat was under cure. And don't forget, we covered that also, the reign of Bress, which was disastrous for the Milesians, or sorry, <laughs> for the two of the Danon. And of course, it led uh, his, uh, his, his uh, abdication, his forced abdication of the throne or the, the, the kingship uh, by the Danons really was uh, something that propelled uh, the Fomorians into the second battle of Moitura. So there's a dog barks out there and Coda, once he hears a dog bark and he just automatically, even if he's asleep, he's asleep on the kitchen floor, right? And the window's open. If a dog barks in the distance while he's asleep, he's, oh, oh, oh. he's such a funny dog. He's a funny animal. He's a pup though. He's a year, you know. In the year, uh, 30, uh, sorry, 3310, this was the seventh year of Bress over Ireland when he resigned the kingdom to Nuadu after the cure of his hand by Dian Kecht, assisted by Craig the artif- art- artificer. I 
do you remember? I can't pronounce that word. For they put a silver hand upon him. 3311, the first year of the reign of Nuada Aragadlov, after his hand had been welded with a piece of refined silver. Uh, 3330, at the end of the 20th year of the reign of Nuadu of the silver hand, he fell in the Battle of Moichura uh, Navomorok. That is the, the Battle of Moichura with the Fomorians by Balor of the Mighty Blows, one of the Fomorians. Oh, sure, there's so much. There's so much. There's so much. Tomorrow, I think we'll we'll transfer to uh, the uh, the, uh, the annals of Ulster uh, for a little bit of a break. But there's so much more we could say. Uh, I mean, even the notes. I mean, I, just the notes here by O'Donovan. There's there's much less uh, of the original text and translation than there are notes. There are copious notes. In fact, the notes for this section would make an entire episode. So we might do uh, we might do more. We might do more for the moment. Uh, it, it being officially Bloomsday, <laughs> um, somebody asked me to read more Joyce, uh, more Ulysses. Uh, I read a s passage last night that I really, really, really like. Uh, I think it's a hauntingly beautiful uh, 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 passage. Um, Yeah, so I just kind of pick out a sort of a, a section. I don't know what to read, but I'll find something fairly quickly now here. Uh, Finn, my dog, heard Coda barking, then shot up, went to run outside barking, and realized it was the speaker. Dogs are funny beings. <laughs> yes, an automatic response is brilliant. They're so funny, aren't they? They can be really, really funny animals. But they're very lovable. I mean, they're just so... They give you love. They're just... That's Alex, by the way. Um, they, they totally just... Uh, uh, give you um, a Donna Jean Porter. Uh, uh, what what is it on on uh, unconditional love? Um, uh, Donna Jean Porter says, "Is yucky like yucky?" Yeah, it's that's how it's pronounced. E o c h a i d h yucky. Apparently, you put a bit of a y in the front of it. Uh, Keith O'Neill says, "Lol, my mum thought a dog a dog was in the garden barking." <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit of Ulysses anybody uh, interested um, I know that uh, we had uh, Nevid was said to have colonised Cove in Cork Great Island in the island where Cove is situated the old name was Ilan Ard Nevid and he's said to have been buried there an old local historian from Cove Mary Broderick told me that Phoenician coins were found there long ago very interesting David thank you for that information into their bar strolled Mr. Dedalus, chips, picking chips off one of his rocky thumbnails. Chips, he strolled. Oh, welcome back, Miss Deuce. He held her hand. Enjoyed her holidays? Tip top. He hoped she had nice weather in Ross Trevor. Gorgeous, she said. Look at the holy show I am, lying out on the strand all day. Bronze whiteness. That was exceedingly naughty of you, Mr. Dedalus told her and pressed her hand indulgently. Tempting poor simple males. Miss Deuce of Satin deuced her arm away. Oh, go away, she said. You're very simple, I don't think. He was. Well, now I am, he mused. I looked so simple in the cradle, they christ christened me Simple Simon. You must have been a doughty, Miss Deuce made answer. And what did the doctor order today? Well, now, he mused. Whatever you say yourself, I think I'll trouble you for some fresh water and a half glass of whiskey. Jingle. With the greatest alacrity, Ms. Deuce agreed. With grace of alacrity towards the mirror, gilt, cantrell and Cochrane's, she turned herself. With grace, she tapped a measure of gold whiskey from her crystal keg. Forth from the skirt of his coat, Mr. Dedalus brought pouch and pipe. 
alacrity she served. He blew through the flue two husky fife notes. By Jove, he mused, I often wanted to see the Morn Mountains. Must be a great tonic in the air down there. But a long threatening comes at last, they say. Yes, yes. Yes, he fingered shreds of hair, her maiden hair, her mermaids into the bowl. Chips, shreds, musing, mute. None, not said nothing. Yes. Gaily Miss Deuce polished a tumbler, trilling, Oh, Dolores, Queen of the Eastern Seas. Was, was Mr. Lidwell in today? In came Lenahan. Round him peered Lenahan. Mr. Bloom reached Essex Bridge. Yes, Mr. Bloom crossed Bridge of Essex. To Martha I must write, by paper, dailies, girl there, civil, Bloom, old Bloom, blue Bloom is on the rye. He was in at lunchtime, Miss Deuce said. Lenahan came forward. Was Mr. Boylan looking for me? He asked. She answered. Miss Kennedy, was Mr. Boylan in while I was upstairs? She asked. Miss Voice of Kennedy answered, a second teacup poised, her gaze upon a page. No, he was not. Miss Gaze of Kennedy, heard, not seen, read on. Lenahan round the sandwich bell, wound his round body round. Peep, who's in the corner? No glance of Kennedy rewarding him, he, sorry, rewarding him he yet made overtures. To mind her stops, to read the only black ones, round O and crooked S. Jingle, jaunty jingle. Girl gold, she read and did not glance. Take no notice, she took no notice, while he read by rote, a sulfa fable for her, flappering flatly. A fox met a stork. Said the fox to the stork, will you put your bill down in my throat and pull up a bone? He droned in vain. Miss Deuce turned to her tea aside. He sighed aside. Oh me, oh my. He greeted Mr Dedalus and got a nod. Greetings from the famous son of a famous father. Who may he be, Mr Dedalus asked. Lenehan opened most genial arms. Who? Who may he be, he asked. Can you ask, Stephen, the youthful bard? Dry. Mr. Dedalus, famous father, laid by, by his dry-filled pipe. I see, he said. I didn't recognise him for the moment. I fear he is keeping very select company. Have you seen him lately? He had. I quaffed the nectar bowl with him this very day, said Lenehan, in Mooney's Enville and in Mooney's Sur Mer. He had received the rhino for the labour of his muse. He smiled at Bronze's tea-bathed lips, at listening lips and eyes. The elite of Aaron hung upon his lips. The ponderous pundit Hugh McHugh, Dublin's most brilliant scribe and editor, and that minstrel boy of the wild wet west, who was known by the euphonious appellation of the Omadden Burke. After an interval, Mr Dedalus raised his grog and, That must have been highly diverting, said he. I see. He see, he drank with far away morning mountain eye, set down his glass. He looked towards the saloon door. I see you have moved the piano. The tuner was in today, Miss Deuce replied, tuning it for the smoking concert, and I never heard such an exquisite player. Is that a fact? Didn't he, Miss Kennedy? The real classical, you know, and blind too, poor fellow. Not twenty, I'm sure he was. Is that a fact, Mr Dedalus said. He drank and strayed away. So sad to look at his face, Miss Deuce condoled. God's curse on bitches bastard. Tink to her pity cried a diner's bell. To the door of the dining room came bold Pat, came bothered Pat, came Pat, waiter of Ormond. Lager for diner, lager without alacrity she served. With patience, Lenehan waited for Boylan, with impatience for jingle jaunty Blaze's boy. Upholding the lid, he, who, gazed in the coffin, coffin, at the oblique triple piano wires. He pressed, the same who pressed indulgently her hand, soft pedalling a triple of keys to see the thicknesses of felt advancing, to hear the muffled hammer fall in action. Two sheets, cream vellum paper, one reserve, two envelopes, when I was in wisdom, Helly's wise bloom, in Daly's Henry flower bought. Are you not happy in your home? Flower to console me and a pin cuts low means something, language of flow. Was it a daisy? 
innocence, that is. Respectable girl, meat after mass. Tanks awfully muchly. Wise bloom eyed on the door a poster. A swaying mermaid smoking mid nice waves. Smoke mermaids, coolest whiff of all. Hair streaming lovelorn for some man, for Raoul. He eyed and saw afar on Essex Bridge. A gay hat riding on a jaunting car. It is third time coincidence. Double entendres galore, says Mary Lanier. Lanier? Lanier? That's all I can do. <laughs> it is just does the most extraordinary work. I don't think in terms of the overall plot. I love the intricate details of Ulysses, which is why I read it. Um, I don't... Uh, I, I'm just too stuck in the moment, and each moment is so brilliantly crafted. Uh there is a video on the, uh, is it the Joyce, James Joyce Center's uh, YouTube page? If I can remember it, I'll share it. It's a discussion between uh, the novelist Will Self and the novelist John Banville uh, about some of the works of Joyce. And it was uh, said quite succinctly, uh, pointed out, uh, I think by Will Self, that Joyce was very poorly sighted, was practically blind. And for him to describe people and, you know, the, the intricacies and the minutiae and the small details of their faces and the smells of them and everything else, uh, that this was a, a remarkable skill of his. But um, anyway, it is said that his writings capture uh, a, a moment in the history of Dublin uh, in colonial times before uh, the rising and before uh, the War of Independence and all that follows uh, that followed. Uh, and it is a remarkable portrait of a vibrant Dublin, although one obviously suffering from, from various issues and problems. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed it this evening. Tomorrow evening, we will go to uh, the Annals of Ulster. Before we finish, I want to talk about episode 100. Uh, episode 100 is scheduled to take place on Friday, providing we're able to do 98 tomorrow and 99 tomorrow, uh, the following day. What I propose to do for volume one, uh, volume for uh, episode 100 is instead of having an open house is just to have a, an unplanned chat and discussion. Several of you are friends of mine. Uh, several of you who appear uh, as commenters, I, I can possibly add you into the discussion. We may join. Uh, I may add a couple of guests uh, who are friends of Mythical Ireland in uh, during the chat. I think we should all just have a chat uh, Rather than plan to read or plan to, we'll have no plan. It'll be just open to going in whatever direction it goes in. Um, and perhaps we'll have a little bit of chat about the, the 99 previous episodes and the fact that all going well, um, that we, 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 sh we, 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 will, we will make it there, you know, to number 100. And if there are questions, yeah, by all means, ask them. If I can answer them, I'll answer them. But I think we should just sort of relax, kick back, have a bit of a celebration. I might have a glass of wine while we're chatting. And, and rather than doing anything formal, we'll just, uh, we'll just kick back and chat and... You know, wherever it goes, it goes. If there are rabbit holes that we need to go down, we'll go down them. If there are labyrinths that open up and we have to follow a particular path through the labyrinth, we will. If anybody has a request for me to read a particular passage of a particular book, I'll consider that as well. Uh, we won't restrict it on time. We'll just have a bit of a hoolie, as we say here in Ireland, which is another way of saying a party. Or we'll have a socially, physically distanced party We'll relax together. We'll just chill and talk about whatever, wherever, whatever subjects come up. Uh, and yes, 7 p.m. Friday for number 100. And Mead 2 says Kathy Maydeo. <laughs> uh, Jim Conway says in Ulster, Yochi is pronounced hoy or hockey. Yeah, it's not too far, actually. Hockey, yochi, hockey, hockey. It's not too far off, Jim. Yeah, interesting that. It's very very interesting how the pronunciations of Irish words vary between the dialects, isn't it? Sandra Patterson says, I'm up for that. No plan is a good plan. Yes, I, do. I think we should celebrate 100, whatever way it be. Solstice Eve, says Philomena, brilliant. The, the Solstice uh, broadcast will be about 
uh, solstice. Uh, and there's lots to talk about. But yeah, that's uh, that's just as a, as a community, as a as a tua, as a tribe, as a gathering of like-minded people and uh, you know open-minded and open-hearted people uh, to just come together and have a celebratory episode. Celebrate. No plan, just enjoy ourselves. So with that in mind, if you have specific suggestions, please let us have them. Uh, probably the best place to make those is on the Mythical Ireland community page. If you're not already a member, I would encourage you to, to join that. If you're watching on Facebook, it means you're already on Facebook. Those of you on YouTube who may not have uh, Facebook accounts, I'm not sure how you would be fixed, but I think most of you are probably on Facebook anyway. Feel free to join in and uh, make suggestions. Uh, but sure, look, one way or another, we'll enjoy ourselves, which is the main thing. Um, we'll see where it goes. In the meantime, keep washing your hands. Use hand sanitizer. Remember to physically or socially distance when you're outside. Keep apart from each other. I was downtown in Drogheda today. A lot of people were just completely oblivious. They weren't keeping their distance. They weren't wearing masks or anything. I was wearing a mask. And I will continue to do so as long as this thing is about because I don't want to catch it and I want to stay safe and healthy. And I'd like for you all to do the same. In the meantime, have a very good evening or a good afternoon or a good morning, depending on where you are in the world. This has been episode 97, episode 98, tomorrow evening at the same time, 8 p.m. Uh, I hope you can all join us for that. In the meantime, Kolosov Ichawa August Slon Gofol Makarjigalir. We will see you all tomorrow evening. All going well. Bye bye now.